So we are exactly halfway through the October international window. Uh, and we're also halfway through the 2025 African Cup of Nations qualifiers. So really, what better time to sit back, reflect and analyze about what we've seen around the continent? Stick around for some analysis and some film study after the break. Welcome to another episode of the African Football Roundup on the African Five Aside Podcast. I'm your host, Maher Mzahi, and this episode, as always, is brought to you by africasacountry.com. This week, we have a thought-provoking essay from Adagbo Onoja entitled, What Does Africa Want? Um, and it's a commentary, an essay about the recent forum on China-Africa cooperation. And uh, we also have a piece from Saeed Hussein, Husseini uh, entitled, fuels errand where he explains nigeria's fuel crisis despite the country's richest man the continent's richest man Eliko dengote building the continent's largest refinery in nigeria so if you that sounds like something you might be interested in, i'm going to post the links in the description below uh, but do go check out africa as a country regardless uh, for all kinds of fascinating articles you'll know the continent better uh, after visiting the website that i guarantee but anyways uh, without further ado uh, let's get down to the football. Me, I've watched six matches over the last three days, six full matches. Um, I've caught up with some highlights of other matches, and I thought I would take the time since, you know, I have a little bit of time these days to sit down, do some film study so that you can see what informs my analysis. And the first match that I wanted to share with you all was the Senegal versus Malawi. Um, I thought this was an important match for several reasons, but the main one being that this is the first match for Senegal's new interim coach, Pap Thiel. Uh, if you look at the stats here, we have 73% ball possession to 27 from Senegal, 22 shots to 2 for, uh, for Senegal as well, uh, 7 shots on target to 0 for Malawi, uh, and Senegal completed 561 passes to Malawi's 165. Now, some of that is due to the fact that Malawi picked up a red card only in the 16th minute. Uh, when it was the goalkeeper, Muntali, tackled Sadio Mane outside the, the box, and he was last man. But still, Senegal managed to score four goals. Aliou Cissé was in charge for 99 matches. 99 matches. You know how many times Senegal managed to score four goals under Aliou Cissé? Three times. Pap Thiel did it in his first match. Now, I know it was only Malawi, but still, when I sat down and reviewed the tape... I saw so many encouraging things. So without further ado, there, there are four main really aspects that I wanted to focus on. Um, let's get into some of the film study. So the first thing that I wanted to show you was that under Pap Tio, and even under Alusise actually, but what one thing that I really liked about Senegal in this match against Malawi was how progressive the center backs are in their passing. And this is Kalidou Koulibaly, but it's also Moussa Nyakate. Uh, Nyakate does a fantastic job of progressing the ball forward, as you can see uh, right here on the left as a left sided center half. Oftentimes, he gets the ball directly to Nicholas Jackson. Kalidou Koulibaly is hitting these long diagonals at the same time. Uh, Nyakate again, straight into the target man. Kalidou Koulibaly again, hitting a diagonal. Nyakate in an advanced position here, being positive. And here, what I liked about this clip in particular was. Uh, you see Sadio Mane, who's supposed to be the left winger on the 4-3-3, um, he's tucked in. He takes this inside space and he drops a little bit to get onto the ball. And Ismail Jacobs, the left back, takes a much wider position. And this is something that you're going to see throughout the film study is how uh, the Senegalese players know one another and they know what each want each want to do and they play off of one of another's spatial awareness you know the how tactically aware they are in space and so Mane picks up the ball over here and immediately Jacobs makes a run Mane tries to flay it through doesn't really work here next we have Nyakate carrying the ball and again look where Mane is it says he's it's almost as if he's in left back position doesn't work here plays it back Nyakate plays it directly into the striker now uh, again, when we talk about chemistry, this is a long ball from the Malawi goal kick. And at, look, as soon as the, the header is won in midfield, Sadio Mane takes off. And Nicholas Jackson takes one touch, and the second one sends Sadio Mane through. And you're not going to catch Sadio Mane there. He wins uh, a foot race, and he wins the red card. And there, really, the game changed. So even after 15 minutes, it's hard to do tactical analysis because the entire dynamics of the game change when it's you know 11 v 10. But still, uh, one thing that I like in this clip is you have 
the 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 this is like kind of like a 4-2-3-1 that Senegal lines up in with Iliman and Diaz, the sole attacking midfielder, and Lamine Kamara and Pap Gay as the two defensive midfielders, you could say, the, the double pivot. But what I like is that, again, they're very, uh, it's almost second nature to them in terms of tactical awareness, in terms of spacing. When one occupies one space, the others compensate and they'll make sure that the other space is occupied. So here, Iliman and Diaz, comes into an unusual, unusual position, drags the defensive midfielder too high up, picks up the ball deep, and look where um, Mohamed Lamine Kamara and look where um, uh, Pap Gay are. They've inverted the shape of the midfield. And NDI plays this, and all of a sudden, Nyakate sort of becomes a defensive midfield. Jacobs is pushed forward, and look at the space that Lamine Kamara fills here as almost as left back, right? Compensating. I mean, it's just beautiful stuff. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Great shape. Again, Sadio Mane is inside. And you just feel that the players know each other very well, that they've drilled this so many times in training. Uh, I, I love this. I love watching this. Again, look at the double pivot here. And what I like, again, is that you have... Pap Gay is more of a true sentinel in that he's he, he can play the lone single pivot role. And what I like is that usually they start in double pivot, but once they're in possession, you can get somebody like Lamine Kamara, who's a very progressive, can be an attacking midfielder. Uh, he's not scared to join uh, Iliman NGI in advanced positions here. And that puts a lot of pressure on the defense. Um, finally, what I'd like to show you as well is, uh, Pap Gay, I thought had a, he was man of the match by far. And what he did very well is as, especially as Malawi were down a man, they had a red card, uh, and there were a lot of Senegalese players in the opposing box. Uh, Pap Gay did a great job of being a threat from deep position. So he didn't have to advance too far. Uh, but when he got the ball and he, you gave him a little bit of space, he would play these wonderful balls over the top, or he even scores a goal. So over here, look at this pass. Very dangerous. Side your money at the second post. Um, over here, this is the first goal. You find Pap Gay with a little bit of space at the top of the box. Boom. Makes no mistake about it. Here, Pap Gay with a little bit of space again. Look at this pass. Beautiful. And one more time. And that leads to a second goal that was offside. And a third time. This this was the third goal that Boulay Di scored. And so, I mean, great, great, great game plan from Pap Tiao in his first match. Uh, like I said, uh, Senegal, they did, um, they did, um, I mean, they played 80, 80 minutes, almost 75 minutes with an extra man. So it becomes difficult to judge them a little bit. But I loved how proactive, how aggressive, how progressive they were. They, I mean, starting from the defending line. Almost every single time the center halves were on the ball, they were looking straight ahead, trying to play balls on the ground to the attacking line. The attacking line, nonstop movement. Uh, Nicholas Jackson, didn't show you this, but countless times, Nicholas Jackson as the point man comes down into midfield. Uh, Saidi Omani makes a run. Ismail Asar makes a run. Um, just nonstop movement from the attacking line. The midfield chemistry was great in terms of if they rotate positions or if they invert positions. They, they, they compensate for one another. And then Pap Gay had to highlight his performance as well. So honestly, A-plus performance from Senegal. A-plus. Hats off to Pap Tiao. And if they continue to play like this, I wouldn't at all be shocked if he ends up winning the job uh, full-time. The Egypt-Mauritania, I don't have too much film uh, on this match. Um, look, Egypt have nine points out of three matches. Nine goals for zero conceded in these last three matches. And it's not as if they have a cupcake group. Cupcake group. They're, you know, they played Cape Verde. Botswana is not the toughest opposition. Mauritania can be tricky to play against. Uh, but still, nine goals, th zero goals against in three matches. I think many people in Egypt are cautious. They're still in wait and see mode. But Hussam Hassan and his staff came in at a fraction of the price of your previous coach. And, I mean, you can't ask much more of him than him doing what he's done, meaning beating the teams that are in front of him. Now, a lot of success comes from, you know, that, Egyptian front line, which I think we all agree is probably the best front line in Africa. Maybe Nigeria have the best strikers, but when you talk about a front line, Senegal, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, but I think we could definitely throw Egypt up there with Omar Manmouche, Mohamed Salah, Mohamed Mustafa, and Trezeguet. Trezeguet, I've said it time and time again, when Egypt need a goal, he's always, almost always good for a goal. Um, and it was the case again against Mauritania. Um, let's look at some statistics really quickly. 
uh, this this match was very close. Um, seventy one percent ball possession for Egypt, sixteen total shots to eleven, uh, six shots on target to one, only one big chance to zero, um, and five hundred and twenty four accurate passes to one hundred and sixty nine. Um, but this you know went into the almost the seventieth minute. It was still nil nil uh, before Trezeguet put the game away. Um, that rhymes. Other than the front line, which I thought was was good, especially when you know Mohamed Salah, I think he has to stay on that right wing. They experimented Hassan Hassan has with Mohamed Salah sort of as like a, a free roaming attacking midfielder, or sometimes as a number nine. I think keep him on the right wing. Whenever he's on the right wing, he's more dangerous and he tends to score goals. Uh, Trezeguet, like I said, you can have him on the left wing because he scores a lot of goals. Is Omar Marmouche your target man? That's one thing I'm not 100 percent sure about. I think you have to include him. You have to include him because of his. Uh, form in the Bundesliga. He's a leading scorer in Germany. Uh, you can't not include him, right? But is he a true target man instead of Mohamed Mustafa? That's one thing I'm still not sure about, you know? Or do you put Mustafa as a striker and then you put Marmouche on the left wing and then, you know, bring Trezeguet as a stri as a substitute if you're, if you're in search of goals? And that's not even counting players like Zizou who played in midfield but is probably better as a winger. Egypt are spoiled for riches. I still don't think they know who they're best front three are at all times it obviously has to include salah i think it has to include marmush but who's that third person the other really positive point that i have for egypt is rami rabia the, the center half that was playing alongside muhammad abdul munim from nice rami rabia has stepped up in a fantastic way this season first of all muhammad abdul munim when he went to nice he, Ramin Abiha is the one that stepped up and he is the main man in defense for El Ahli now. He scored an incredible amount of important goals in the CAF Champions League already for El Ahli. He's been a rock behind and it was the same way for Egypt. Uh, I thought he was one of the men of the match as well. Um, he always had that potential. I remember watching him at the under-20 AFCON in Algeria in 2013 and he was a star then. But it seemed like he never really hit that potential that he has now. If he continues this form over the next uh two months or so he's going to become one of the best defenders in africa even at the age of how old is he like 29 30 uh 31 maybe very very good player and he's been at, again hat tip off to him as well definitely one of the the good aspects the good notes of this international break but the what i really wanted to show you guys was marwan the uh, the el ahli midfielder Again, when we talk about Egypt uh, over the last seven years at the AFCON, it's always been this team is bifurcated. They're split in the middle between the defense and the attack, and we need somebody to link the defense and the attack. Who can that person be? We're always looking for somebody. We talked about Ibrahim Adel, Adel as a ball progressor, but how about Marwan Atiyah and his passing ability? He, I think, was man of the match here um, just because, I mean, look at this passing, you know, just diagonal balls. I didn't include a lot of clips but he was also very good defensively and he's almost like in this pure low role you know where he's the deepest man but he's a technical player so it's it's not like a bruising destroyer in the in the number six role he's a, a deep playmaker and he can play these kinds of passes and the second goal Mohamed Salah's goal it all started with this beautiful outside of the boot pass from Marwan Ateya plays in as a medic left back whose name I'm blanking on and Mohamed Salah finishes so Marwan Ateya was my man of the match and uh, I think He's got to start there for the rest of the matches for Egypt as that deep lying playmaker. Now, if you have a deep lying playmaker, I think you need two ball winners in front of him, right? Or two at least very complete midfielders. Mohamed Anani is probably one of those players. And I think he plays well in that role. Who's the second one? Is it Akram, tu Akram Tufiq? I think it's him. But I always thought he was maybe better as number six, not really as a number eight. Uh, is it Zizo? I don't think so. I think he's more of a, a winger than really like a, a number eight, that sort of shuttling midfielder. Hamdi Fethi, no, he's too limited, I think, uh, in, in his role. He's probably better as number six as well. Oh, he can play eight, but he's just not creative enough. I, th I think you need one more central midfielder. I don't know who it is yet. Is it Imam Ashur? That's what they need to find out. They need to find out who is on the front line. They need to find out who is that third midfielder and probably who's going to be your left back going forward. Um, yeah. But other than that, I thought Egypt have been very, very good. Mauritania were very well organized, difficult to break down as they always are. Uh, it was a typical Mauritania performance in that 4-4-2. Um, they were never really a threat unless it was a set piece or the magic of Abu Bakari Koita, who was fantastic again. Uh, have, definitely have to keep an eye on him. 
Um, but overall, Egypt were by far the better side. The third team that I thought I was impressed by their performance was my, my country, Algeria versus Togo. Um, look, Algeria, when Vladimir Pekovic took over, the, the really what was asked of him was fix the central defense, fix the defensive midfield problems. We need to defend better on set pieces. And initially, Algeria was conceding too many goals under Pekovic, way too many goals. But in the last three matches, he's really come along. Uh, we've only conceded one goal in those three matches. We've scored a lot of goals. We've been playing some fantastic football. Um, Asa Mondi is, is a center half over the last decade or so, but he's been playing as a right back and it tends to work. That imbalance or symmetry with Ryan Itnuri, the Wolves fullback on the other side, in my opinion, one of the best attacking fullbacks in the world. That symmetry, that is asymmetry, that imbalance tends to work in my opinion. Um, but still, because you have Eitnuri on the left, you have Ben Sabaini, who was very, very good in central defense. Tugai is, oh, sometimes I like him, but he makes too many mistakes. And the first goal that Algeria concedes is really on him. He lets the ball go over his head. Um, and, and it was really just a, a great finish by Togo, but he needs to do better there. Um, the other question about Algeria is who is going to play in midfield? They have a lot of injuries. Nabil Bentaleb uh, suffered a heart attack. He's out indefinitely indefinitely with uh, with Lille. Um, you also have Ismail Ben Nasser, who's been injured on and off for the last three years, and it's been very frustrating. He hasn't been the Ismail Ben Nasser of 2009. That was the best player at the AFCON in 2019. Um, so we need to find solutions. Um Hussam Awar has been really great from attacking midfield. He's added, I think, I think he is at four or five goals in 11 or 12 matches for Algeria now. So that's great. We finally found a piece there. Um, Hisham Boudaoui had a really great second half for Algeria as well as a sort of shuttling midfielder box to box. Who's the defensive midfield? Is it Ramiz Zarouki? He's kind of a boring horizontal passer, good tactical discipline. But really where Algeria were hurt in the first half was that the midfielders, even though you had Zaruki there, they didn't really have a lot of... You see how Senegal, like, their, their midfielders, when one goes to a different area of the pitch, the others will compensate. They, they're sort of interchangeable in that sense. That You know what I'm saying? With Algeria, that wasn't necessarily the case. So if one gets pulled out of position, there's no compensation. They just leave a hole there, and Togo capitalized on that. So Algeria definitely needs to do better in that regard. But that comes with you know, playing games with one another. So Algeria needs to find who their three are. Unfortunately, like their best players are often injured, but I think Budawi could be one of those players. I think Awad could be one of those players. Now, who's the third one? Is it Zafgan? Is it Ben Nasser? When he comes back, can you rely on him? Is it Zerouki? I, I don't know. But they need to find who that third one is, that number six that can play a single pivot if necessary. Uh, the other question about Algeria is who's going to play on the opposite wing from Riyad Mahrez. Uh, Saeed bin Rahma has been given a chance under this new coach. He never really impressed me that much, but he was good against Togo. Uh, two goals, lots of activity in the first half, one world-class goal and one penalty. He's one of those players that's capable of being frustrating and capable of being world-class as well. For me, he's not the solution just because of that trait that I just outlined. But, uh, if not him, who? I think Mohamed Amin Amoura, who's leading the Bundesliga in assists with Wolfsburg, four assists and three three starts. Maybe Belumi at Hull City, uh, or maybe Ferris Shaibi at Eintracht Frankfurt. For me, those are the three best choices to start at left wing. And Ben Rahma, you can throw on if you're really desperate uh, and in search for a goal. But ultimately, I think Algeria had a great match, and it was great when they threw on their depth. Amoura, Boudaoui, Guiri, Fersi, they're the ones that took the performance to another level and they really put the final nail in the coffin against Togo as Algeria wins 5-1. Uh, so definitely some encouraging signs versus Togo um, as the Fenix uh, prep. Now they're only a point away prep to, to, to qualify for the 2025 AFCON uh, in Morocco. So another team that really impressed me uh, was the Moroccan Atlas Lions playing at home to Central African Republic. Um, and what I really liked was that Walid Regragi used an ambitious new formation. You know, he was sort of criticized after the AFCON of just sticking with his 4-1-4-1 that worked really well at the effort, at the World Cup, at the FIFA 2022 World Cup, um, and that he was too rigid, uh, right? He never wanted to switch sometimes the players or, or the formation. Um, but he comes here and he plays a 4-2-2-2. Um, it worked to per perfection. I mean, look at the statistics, 75%. 
uh, seven to one shots on target, 566 passes to 144, uh, complete domination. And, and what, what's really good about this 4222 that I liked, uh, it often, sometimes it, as you know, ball, as they were in possession and, and it became fluid, sometimes it moved to a 433 where, um, Elias Ben Sarir, uh, would come down into midfield alongside, uh, I almost said Nordin Arambat, Sofian Amrabat and Azdi Nunahi. Um, and then you had Rahimi as a, sort of like a right winger, Yusuf al Kabi, uh, in front of the center halves as a number nine, and then uh, Abd Abdusamad Zazuli as a left winger, uh, as your attacking three front line. But it was, even like when it moved to a fluid 4-3-3, it was an imbalanced one that was always leaning towards the left, which forces the Central African Republic defense to switch over to that side as well. And it isolates Ashraf Hakim and gives him the space he needs uh, as he's almost by himself on that right flank. And it worked really, really well, especially, I think, it was for the second goal for Morocco. So let's do a, a little bit of basic uh, film study here. Um, so the first 20 minutes was really domination by Morocco, nothing to say, really. Uh, a lot of the attacks down the right wing with Ashraf Hakimi, despite the fact that, uh, you know, Morocco doesn't have that, well, what do you call it, the Bermuda Triangle that they used to play with, you know, with Hakimi as a right back, Ziyech as a right winger, and Azdi Nunahi as that right central midfielder. Uh, that worked to perfection at times, you know, but uh, still lots of attacks just by H Hakimi being world-class really down that right wing. Um, and the goal comes in the 20th minute from the right wing as well. And here, if, you, if you're the Central African Republic, if you're a coach Raul Savoy, you're pulling your hair out because Hakimi plays an entry pass to the right wing. I believe it's Sofian Rahimi here. And he does this thing where he just hesitates. He just holds his run a little bit because he knows that he's being marked and he's waiting for his defender to not pay attention anymore. And when the defender least expects it, that's when he makes his run. So he just hangs on a little bit and then boom, not paying any attention anymore. And Rahimi is waiting for him to make that run too. And he gets down the byline, beautiful cross. Ayub al Kabi, great control, good awareness, finds Rahimi again. Rahimi hits a little ball on, on target, and Abdul Zazuli, uh, Abdul Samit al Zazuli, uh, knocks in the rebound. But that comes from Rahimi's hesitation, that intelligence, uh, knowing when and how to make that run. Uh, but again, if you're a Central African Republic coach, Raul Savoy, who was on the, the show last week, you got to be pulling your hair out because what you would, you don't mind. If, if uh, Hakimi has the ball far away from goal. So it's almost like, don't fall asleep. Be extra defensive. Cut off that lane, that running lane, and let him have the ball 30 yards away. But don't let him make that run. Don't fall asleep and don't let him make that run. I know it's easier said than done. But that was just, I'm not going to say amateur defending, but it was a, it was actually a world-class move from, from Morocco and from Hakimi. Um what else did we see? And this is the third goal again. Look at the third goal. Look how unbalanced it is, right? I mean, normally you would have the right back, Ashraf Hakimi, just off of uh, Jamal Harkous, right? The, the right center half um, in a normal symmetrical system. But here you have the double pivot. You have one of your attacking midfielders as Abde, and you have the other one, Elias Ben Sagir, right there. So you have a diamond midfield kind of. All on the left side of the pitch, you have the center halves in position, you have the left back in position. And then you have, where are your strikers? Look, they're playing normal two strikers. So you have everybody on the left side of the pitch except for Ashraf Hakimi for the third goal. And look what happens now. Ball finds itself to midfield. Sofian Arabat lifts his head, plays Hakimi. And look at this touch from Hakimi. This is why he's world class, right? Layoff, boom. But that works because there's an imbalance. There's an asymmetry at the beginning of the move. Give Hakimi his space. Everybody focuses on the left side of the pitch. And then when that, when that switch happens, he has the kind of space and the time to put on his world-class technique and his world-class moves. That's why I really loved Morocco's third goal because it showed me that Walid Regragui's formation worked in that match. So hats off to Morocco. I thought that was another A-plus performance. Um, and that they look very, very good uh, against Central African Republic in a tricky match, by the way. Now, let's move on to the not-so-good. Uh, Tunisia versus Comoros, uh, matched by uh, Fauzi Benzerti. <laughs> and I almost want to apologize uh, for forcing you guys to watch this, because this was not the most entertaining fixture. And I could have put 15 minutes of tape of Tunisia being too slow in the build-up. They're not showing any urgency. 
uh, too many horizontal passes from the center half to the defensive midfield, back to the center half, to the fullback, to the winger, back to the fullback, to the center halves. And it takes them sometimes, you know, one minute, two minutes, three minutes. Okay, I'm exaggerating with three minutes to progress the ball at the pitch. And it's just, there's no urgency until they fall behind against Comoros in the 60th minute. And then they try to show urgency, but it's too late then. Um, this is something that's killing me with Tunisia, with Ghana, with Nigeria. There's no sense of urgency. There's no verticality. Uh, often playing with too many conservative players in midfield. Um, it's the exact opposite of what I was showing you with Senegal, where the even the center halves were being extremely progressive, getting their heads up, playing the ball on the ground to the strikers directly. Um, and then you had all that dynamic movement with the front line in the midfield. This is the exact opposite. So here you can see Yassine Mariah passing the ball uh, to Montasar Talbi, the other center half. Passing the ball to a defensive midfielder. Okay, this is nil nil, by the way, in the first half. Uh, what's going to happen here? Back to the center half. So I think it's going to go to the left back now. And this is just too easy to defend for Comoros because when the ball finally comes in like that, I mean, it's just, and there's very little movement from the front line, right? Uh, when it, it's, and when it is, it's not done with real intention. It's movement for movement's sake. Um, and Comoros are just too easy. They're too comfortable defending all of this. And I don't want to take too much away from Comoros because I'm going to show you how they defended well after. But, I mean, look at this. This is just pedestrian stuff from Tunisia. Pedestrian. Uh, again, I could play you, without exaggerating, 15 minutes of tape like this. Um, there needs to be a lot more urgency. Algeria had this problem, you know, for the last uh, 18 months as well until Pekovic's last three or four matches. It's just too horizontal, not vertical enough. Again, credit to Comoros for almost forcing them to play this way. But Tunisia, this has been a problem for a very long time. You see? I mean, and then, and then, and then. I mean, this part just drove me crazy. When Tunisia finally do progress the ball up the pitch, this is the second half, they're down 1-0. They've made some substitutions, and I thought Hannibal Mezbri, who came on, uh, Elias Khiri, who came on, they were much more progressive. They got their face forward. You know, they, they started passing the ball into the attacking lines. They started moving themselves. Uh, but when they started to do that, even when they did that, Tunisia wouldn't pull the trigger on a shot. <laughs> I mean, this is just, this is incredible footage, what I'm about to show you. I mean, okay, ball comes into the center half. Great. Now look at all the movement around. Great. Okay, somebody's dropping from the attacking line. Okay, nice ball in first time. That's all right. Picks the ball up. Uh, back into midfield, great, Mejbri, beautiful body feint, hits it out to the wing, okay, makes a run, perfect, look at that, oh, beautiful technique, hit it, hit it, hit it, hit it, please hit the ball, somebody shoot, please, somebody shoot, <laughs> they took like 10, 10 touches in the box, and nobody even thought of shooting the ball, and Comoros gather the ball on the counter attack, and this is the exact opposite. Mizian Maulida does a great job. One against five, one against six. No worries. I'm going to be courageous. I'm going to take you on. Win the ball back over here. Take a dribble. Boom. Get my head up. Hit the post with the shot. You see somebody that's way more like, right? Tunisia, and, and his goal was the same way. Look, boom. Didn't think about dribbling. Didn't think about anything like that. Mizian Maulida really taught Tunisia a lesson, in my opinion. I'm like, man, when you have a half a chance... Hit the ball. You saw what Pap Gay was doing from outside of the box as well for Senegal. Tunisia needs somebody, <laughs> the coach, to tell them we need to be more aggressive in our mindset. We need to be more, not just in our passing, not just in our movement. We need to be more energetic. We need to have more urgency. But also when we have a half chance, we need to start shooting, right? And then finally, I just wanted to finish with this clip from Comoros because I thought the way they defended in the last 15 to 20 minutes of this match was immaculate. You could just see that they were highly motivated, very well organized. Look how they're closing down all of the passing lanes. Nobody's neglecting any of their defensive duties. Um, I, I just love to watch them defend really over the last 15, 20 minutes. And when they did get the ball, they would rush down the pitch, make sure they were conserving it, try to win cheap fouls. Tunisia has nowhere to go with it. They end up playing it long, and to, and the, the goalkeeper, Pandor, collects with ease. So yeah, hats off to Comoros, but Tunisia were not good enough. That's the first loss for Tunisia at home in the AFCON qualifier since 2010. So uh, they're going to have to 
win this next match against Comoros or things are going to start to get very negative for their coach Fauzi Benzerti. Uh, I'm going to wrap things up with Ghana versus Sudan. I don't have any film for this, but this was interesting because there was a little bit of pre-match drama, right? You had the Ghana FA boss Kraku rip into the players uh, prior to the match, uh, saying, you know, like that it's not going to be acceptable that, you know, if they don't start winning games and showing more effort and so on and so forth. And of course, that clip makes it out to social media. You have James Kwesi Apia, the Sudanese coach who is actually from Ghana. He is uh, contacted by CAF and they say you have a con conflict of interest because you're on the board for the Ghanaian FA. So he had to resign from that. Um, the match was played in Accra instead of Kumasi. The pitch seemed a little bit better there. And the pressure was really on Ghana, who up until that point only had one point in two matches. And Sudan had three points after defeating Niger. My overall thoughts for that match as I watched it was it was clear which side was the more confident side. It was clear which side was the more cohesive side, the better coach side. Sudan knew who they were and they knew what they came to do. They were organized. They were almost never outnumbered when defending in the box. Um, and essentially, it was much more of the same from Ghana. Ghana, Tunisia, Nigeria, uh, same same, <laughs> same WhatsApp group. Uh, very little creativity from Ghana besides Mohamed Kudus, but even he didn't have a great game. Very little like running off of the ball, unless it was you know maybe Ernest Nuama, sometimes Antoine Semenyo, but he's so clumsy and such a bad finisher. When I watch them, it isn't that the players aren't trying for Ghana. They clearly care. I, th I think I don't think it's I don't think it's fair when people say, oh, they don't care. They're professional footballers. No, they care. They just have no momentum. And momentum comes with good results, better players, better coaching. And then, you know, good results bring more good results. You know, you have to sort of string them together and build them together. But right now. It's the same players, the same coaching. The results are not there. And it seems like they're the, the black stars are stuck in a rut. One Ghana did have a few chances because they did have a few chances. Sudanese, Sudan's veteran players stepped up. Goalkeeper Mohamed Mustafa from Azam FC, maybe the best player in Africa for this round of matches. Uh, he pulled off no less than three to four world class saves. Um, and he deserves a lot of credit for that. And Amdan Ajib, the, the Sudan captain, uh, playing as a right back, had a man's game. Lots of last-ditch tackles. Karshum in defense, very, very good performance as well. Uh, I liked, you could see James Kwesi Apia, like was the better coach in that he was making more proactive substitutions in the 60th minute. You could see, for example, when Ghana had corner kicks. Well, watch in the next match as well, because they're going to play each other in a few days. When Ghana had a corner kick, watch Sudan strikers always pinning the Ghanaian defense back a little bit, always ready for the counterattack, even if they weren't very successful. Um, so yeah, uh, second half of a double header for this match in particular is going to come down to coaching. And Otto Ado, the Ghana coach, I didn't like what he said, that Sudan got lucky and that they won't be lucky in Libya. I think you know, those are big words. He better back them up because from what I saw, Sudan can very easily repeat that performance or even win in Libya, uh, in Benghazi, I believe. Anyways, that's been uh, 35 minutes of uh, <laughs> of uh, film study and of the matches. Those are my thoughts of the matches that I watched. Uh, other than that, you know, there have been... Um, Su Sudan, I think, for me, is the, is the main surprise of these first three matches as we're halfway through. But also, you know, hats off to Uganda, who have seven points and are, are top of the group. Uh, Zimbabwe have looked decent. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire have been cruising. They, they have nine points in three matches. Um... The, the main, the most disappointing teams, in my opinion, Ghana, Nigeria, Tunisia. These are the, I mean, for the giants. The North Africans, other than that, are, are, are living up to their billing. That's good. South Africa, I didn't find the match to watch back, uh, but 5-0 against Congo. Absolutely incredible. But it's mostly the same side, right? From what I understand, uh, Mukwena had a good game. Mudao had a good game. Uh, so, I mean, we're not really surprised, right? This is, this is what we've come to expect from Bafana. And I think I'm going to watch, I think this next match against Congo, uh, I want to see true good, some good Bafana football. Uh, Mark Brees had his coaching his pants off considering, you know, Samuel Eto puts obstacles in his way at every international window. Uh, they end up winning against Kenya, I believe four one. It's a match he should win because when you look at the starting 11 for Cameroon, in my opinion, it's a top five starting 11 on the African continent. So, 
um, he should be beating Kenya like that, but it's not easy when you have you know the problems between the ministry and the federation. So hats off to Mark Brees as well. Uh, but yeah, other than that, I think the rest of the results have been fairly predictable. Uh, let me know which matches you watched, uh, who impressed you, who didn't impress you, and um, what you're expecting for these next round of matches. Maybe we're going to have time to do a film study for them as well. I don't think we will, um, but I'll definitely be reacting to match day four of the 2025 African Cup of Nations qualifiers again. Sorry if I'm rambling a little bit. Sorry if I'm stuttering a little bit. It's very late at night here. Um, but thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, if you're watching this video on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel. You'd be doing me a big favor. Please share this video if you've enjoyed it as well. Uh, some of this analysis that you saw, if you agreed, you know, show your friends. Um, give it a thumbs up as well. Comment. Uh, we tend to respond to comments, you know, almost all the time. Um, yeah, follow us on other social media platforms. Follow Africa as a country. And if you're listening on audio platforms, please remember to give us a five-star review. That really, really does help us as well. So thanks again. I'll leave it there for now. And I'll speak to you in a few days to recap match day four of the 2025 AFCON qualifiers. Speak then. Peace.